That, that's me, your lighthearted host and expressionist. And this, this is my podcast, Love and Lies. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here with, what are we going to call you? Steve. We're going to call him Steve. This is one of our anonymous interviews. The reason why I wanted to interview Steve is because he actually tried to commit suicide and survive. Is that what they call it? Survive? I mean, I there's a diagnosis. So, yeah. For um, yeah, attempted suicide. Attempted and, suicide. Uh, failed. And failed. Failed. Tell the listeners uh, what you did. I, um, I stabbed myself in the chest eight times with a 10-inch knife. Eight times. And did you, um, when you did that, did you know exactly where? I Googled it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you Googled how to kill yourself? I Googled how to, to stab yourself in the chest. Um, aiming for the heart, basically. Yeah. And the reason why you chose knife? I chose knife because I had nothing left. I had no vehicles to asphyxiate myself with. Um, I didn't own any weapons. Um, didn't have any rope. I don't think I had anything high enough in the house at the time. However, I learned after the fact that I could have killed myself by hanging myself by the plumbing under the sink, but not to make light of it. But And we don't want to educate. <laughs> right, right. No, no. But... Um, you're, so, well, you're very, you're a very, um, you're a peace and you're a happy man. So absolutely. we want people to know that right off the bat. It's not like we're making light of not this very no. serious topic. Mm -hmm. So you go to commit suicide and you only have a knife and this is because you lost everything. Lost everything. So let's go. Cause we'll go back to the actual time and place that this happened, but you had a thriving business. You had a wife. You mm -hmm. had children. Child, right. Yeah. Oh. And so what children. was life like? Had four dogs and a and a and a human. So used right. to say I had five. <laughs> so um what was life like? Life wasn't wasn't bad at all. I mean it wasn't great. Um, you know, no relationship is perfect, I don't I don't believe. Um I had just to give some for I need some knowledge on the front end here, I had relapsed on, on drugs in 2008. This attempt occurred in 2014. So um, were you a drug addict before? <clears throat> oh, I've been an addict all my life, yeah. So that's drinking and drugs? No, and no, no drinking, um, drugs, opiates primarily, opiates and cocaine, no heroin, never used heroin. And then your childhood, your parents, they were very well off. Very well off. Um, I was a very angry child. Um, I had a spouse, I, had a, I mean a spouse, I had a sister, um, um, and um, my parents fought all the time. They were both very successful, but they fought. So um, you were raised in a house that basically anything that you kind of really needed was taken care of? Absolutely, yeah. Um, and probably what most would consider if they had this lifestyle that they had it kind of made? Privileged, okay. very privileged, yeah. Um, but then you weren't told that you were loved, that you never no. heard your parents say, I love no. you until... I was 28. Um, I don't use that as an excuse, though, but I was taken out of, my, out of the home by my grandparents at six years old um, because they noticed that my parents fighting... My mother was an alcoholic. My dad wasn't. My mother was an alcoholic, and she was addicted to benzodiazepines, uh, uh, Valium. And she got very very angry and very mean at night. So my dad wouldn't engage her, but, you know, you really don't have a choice when your spouse gets like that. Um, was there, like, physical abuse or was it just, like, yelling? I, I saw physical abuse on one occasion, yeah. So pretty much your childhood was mom was messed up on drugs, but you had everything. Right. Um, but this isn't an excuse for you because you started – why did you start doing drugs? Um. I mean, obviously, you were um, suffering because anybody that's not told that I love you yeah. by the age you're 28, that's, that's yeah. traumatizing. I think, um, 
I don't know. I think it was just in me. I think I do believe in the genetic element of uh, addiction. Um, you know, my dad drank, but he didn't drink to excess. But my mom drank. She didn't drink a lot, but she was an alcoholic. Um, and she took the pills, as I said. Um, so I believe I had the gene and wanted to use. So that's, that is interesting that you said that because you could have chose to believe that you don't. True. And back then, we didn't know about that. Right. So I started smoking at about nine years old, stealing my mom's cigarettes, um, and started smoking marijuana at 12. Did you have suicidal thoughts at those? Never. Okay. So you get out of the house, and um, you are married, thriving business. You have cars. You have toys. Married twice, yeah. My first marriage lasted six years. Uh, wasn't wasn't the greatest uh, relationship in the world, but uh, had a wonderful daughter. Was my first wife. Um, we divorced, and then I met my second wife, and we were together for sixteen years. And that's when you know we had a good life together. Um, she had a business, I had businesses, um, and I started doing drugs in two thousand and eight. Did she know that you were doing drugs? Eventually she did. It didn't take her long. Um, and she divorced me. She tried. She tried to help me, but you can't help someone who's addicted to drugs or alcohol unless they want help. Were, when she left, did you start losing things at that point, or was it that you were losing things that she left? Or No. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sorry. Um, no. Um, I started losing things when she died. She died of breast cancer. Um, five years after we divorced. In 2013, she was diagnosed, well, 2012, she was diagnosed with uh, a very aggressive form of breast cancer, and she died in 2013. And that's when I began to lose things. I spent a lot of money on drugs, cocaine, smoking cocaine. Um, not so much um, opiates at that time, but... Yeah, I started spending a lot of money. I spent, I spent a lot of money, let's put it that way, in 14 months. In 14 months, I had nothing left. Trucks so, were gone, car, everything. They were coming to seize the house. So. So, so you were a functioning addict, basically up until the point, or well, what was work like? Because there's people out there that are abusing and going to work and functioning right. and then going back home and abusing and then getting back up right. and... Was that your life? Did you know that? Obviously, you knew that you were an addict, but became, did you think that you had things under control? Was there depression? No, I didn't think I had things under control. Um, what happened is I continued to work. I continued to go out and bid jobs. Um, I thought that people didn't know I was using, you know, smoking cocaine first thing in the morning and all day long. Um, but, <clears throat> excuse me, I was, and I'm sure they knew. Um, certainly the contractors knew that I was getting jobs from. He, they stopped giving me work. Um, at some point, probably six months into that 14-month stretch, I stopped working. Just all together? You all just together. stopped showing up? St yeah, well, yeah, I didn't have any more estimates. No one was calling. The phone was ringing, and I just stopped working. So, And I just tried to anesthetize myself. Um, it was, my mother died and my father died within three months of each other. And it was within 18 months my wife died after that. So you lost a lot. Lost a lot, yeah. Um, so at this point, you, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? I mean, are you in your home at this point I'm, still? I'm my, She's I'm left? I'm in a home. I'm in my home, yeah. <clears throat> um, I was renting a home. And she's gone. It's me and the four dogs. We had four dogs. Where's your daughter? My daughter is, um, we had, I had joint custody with my first wife. Um, she's up in the north part of Scottsdale. I'm in Gilbert. And um, I really wasn't seeing her that much either. Um, basically, I think everybody knew I've never asked because these people aren't around. The people who were in my life, who dropped out of my life, weren't around for me to ask, hey, did you know? 
but I believe they knew. And that's when people started kind of distancing, distancing themselves from me um, based on that, the fact that I was screwed up. So when do the suicidal thoughts start coming in? About 12, 12 months after my wife died, about a year. What was the thought that you just, did you just want to die to be with her? Did you just want to die to stop the drugs? Did you, why did you want to die? My life, um, it was just empty. You know, she was truly my best friend. I was really, truly in love. I, it was a great love affair, um, love at first sight. She was married when I met her. Um, you know, I took one look at her and I thought, I just knew I'd marry this lady. And <clears throat> um, like I said, it wasn't always wine and roses, but it was, it was a good relationship. It was pretty special. So I really didn't realize until about a year after she was gone that my life was pretty empty without her, you know. Um, I just became really withdrawn, very depressed. And at the time, I didn't realize it. But So the best thing I, was, I could do for myself at that time was the only thing I knew how to do, and that was from experience, was just numbing myself. How much money were you spending a day? Four to $600 on crack. With no money coming in? No money coming in. I had about... Uh, Two hundred forty thousand dollars in the bank, and you had like literally the cars and trucks and had two trucks, and a, boats, yeah, two and pickups. No, I didn't have a boat at that time. I had a, uh, I had two trucks, and I had a brand new, really nice sports money car. Money in the bank, lots of money. And in the bank. now, you start selling stuff. Start selling all the furniture, which was very nice, right? Everything. Um, I don't think I consciously thought. In fact, I know I didn't consciously think, well, I better start divesting myself of all these things because I'm not going to need them. Um, I needed money. I blew through the money fast. So it wasn't like you knew you were going to be committing suicide mm -hmm. and the people typically that's a sign of suicide is when people start giving things away. You're, you're just literally just trying to, you're just doing drugs. Yeah, I need more, more money for drugs. A couple hundred thousand dollars goes fast. I mm -hmm. mean, that's nothing. That's a couple millions, nothing. Okay, so more drugs, more money. Now all of a sudden the cars are gone, the furniture's gone, the house is empty, and what the hell starts happening? Well, I got a notice from the landlord. What I'd done is I'd paid a year in advance, a year's rent in advance, in a nice home um, in a nice area, and I didn't have any more money to pay the rent, so I was a month behind. And I got a notice, uh, you know, went through the, their due diligence, and they were going to come and seize the house on um, a Tuesday. So I had to be out, or they were going to kick me out. Okay, so where are you mentally at this point? I mean, uh, you, they're going to come, you know, and, and where does suicidal th thoughts start coming into the picture where you're starting to, okay. did you have, because I know that a lot of people that are suicidal, they start fantasizing and they start um, even thinking. So mm -hmm. you had a plan, obviously. Well, so where? Yeah. tell me about your story because everybody's different. But where did the suicidal thoughts and, and the, the motivation? Right. Um, let me back up a little bit. A month prior to my attempt, I actually called the National Suicide Prevention Hotline on a Saturday night um, because I was seriously – concerned about myself, I, I knew that, you know, I had no more bed. I mean, I was laying on the floor, um, and I was really worried about my condition and where I was going. Um, I didn't have any more money for drugs, so at that point, I was running out, but I called, and they came out. Um, I called. I got a guy in Kansas City. I was on the phone for two hours, and then at midnight, two people showed up, two crisis intervention people with um, National Suicide Prevention um, people showed up at my house and they stayed until three in the morning talking to me. And I was, I was new, a new man. I was rejuvenated. I thought, wow, this is great. You know, they hope, uh, they offered hope. They offered, um, and are you wanting out. to commit? Are you wanting to quit doing drugs at this point? Yeah. I'm, I'm wanting to get my life back. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Yeah, I'm wanting to get right again. Um, and so I was, I was great. Um, that was Saturday night. They said someone would be there Wednesday at one o'clock. She never showed up. She never called. I called. She said, I'm sorry. I was on the west side of Phoenix. She said, I'll be there Sunday at one o'clock. I waited all day Sunday. She never showed up. Um, by Monday, I was right back to square one. I was despondent, dejected, probably times 10. And now I'm thinking, okay, that was a pretty good indicator that I'm probably supposed to do it if that's not rational thinking, but I wasn't thinking rationally at the time, you know. Were you coming <clears throat> off of drugs because you couldn't afford them anymore and this is why you were disoriented? Yeah, I, and I think that had something to do with it. Um, definitely with the amount of cocaine I was doing, um, there was a psychosis that, that had set in over that period of time. It was definitely a psychosis, excuse me. Um, and... Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Not thinking clearly. Um, okay, so now you start getting on the computer and Googling. And the reason why you have to do it with knives is because now we know you have nothing in the house. You don't have a car, you don't have a gun, you don't have anything. Everything's gone. That block with the knives in, it in the kitchen, yeah. yeah. So you start Googling and you can find this information, apparently. I, I Googled it. Uh, the first first thing that came up was uh, even gave you illustrations of how how to hold the knife wow. and, and where to you know how to plunge it as it as it was put. Um, so I thought, okay, well I've got this. That was on a Thursday. Um, I I had run out of cocaine, I had no cocaine, and this was on a Tuesday. I attempted suicide, so I hadn't any cocaine from that period of time to the Tuesday. Um, had a little bit of Xanax, but my main thing at that point was I wasn't sleeping. Um, I couldn't sleep. I was, Why weren't you sleeping? Because I knew they were coming to take the house. So I, I was going to be homeless. And, was and that's it, your biggest fear is being homeless? Oh, it was my huge fear, yeah. I was not going to be homeless. I was not going to be one of those people. Um, what was I going to do with my dogs? Um, you know, plus I was feeling a lot of shame. Um, I was going through a lot of a lot of different a whole range of emotions at that point. Especially with not no um, sleep. Now your sleep deprivation was huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you somehow accept in your mind that you're going to commit suicide, and this is the way that you're going to do right. it. And you wait a couple of days because you. I waited till Tuesday. They were coming. The landlord was coming Tuesday at noon. Um, and I wanted to wait and see maybe would he call and say, look, I'll give you a couple months or something like that. No, no phone call. So um, I knew that it was going to go down on Tuesday. All right. So where did you do this? In the den? In, in the, the office. In the office. the office was in the front of the house located by the front door, just off the front. And it's an empty office? I had, I had the desk. I still had the desk. Still had the desk. Yeah. And um, so you walked to the kitchen? Actually, I'd had that knife in on the desk for a few days, three or four days. So you're walking into, so this moment happens where you say, okay, right now is the time. Well, he showed up at about 11.05. I remember looking at the plantation shutters and seeing him, I could see his blue car pull up. And I'm thinking, oh boy, he's early as usual. Um, I left a note outside on the front door saying, you'll find me in the office. However, I forgot. And by habit, I locked the front door behind me. So, because I was going, I wasn't going to be there when he got there. <clears throat> so he saw the note. I heard him on the telephone. You were going to, you were setting it up that he was going to find your dead body. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, were you doing that because you wanted to be found or were you doing that because, you wanted to say fuck you motherfucker or was it why why did you want why did you leave that note the main reason was i didn't want the dogs to get out we had four pomeranians and they loved to go outside and if they could get outside without leashes on they were in a bolt and um they weren't equipped to do that i mean our dogs were like our kids so i was really fearful of that um 
But I put them in the hallway. We had a big hallway, and I put them in the hallway behind a baby gate. But that's never stopped them from knocking it down when they want to get it, get out. So I was concerned about them getting out. And I even put a note just inside the door saying, the dog's in the hallway, please don't let him out. So I left a note for my daughter. Um, and uh, I left a, just a general note as well, apologizing. So... Um, you were doing this. Hmm? You were doing this. Oh, I was doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was done. So, make a long story short, between that fifty-five in that fifty-five minutes, police department showed up outside, um, fire department, and but this is before you even did anything. Hadn't even done it yet. And oh my gosh! I'm, okay, wor so I'm working up like... to it. Yeah. I'm, so it's like they're going to plow through the door, right? And you got to hurry up and kill yourself. Um, I heard the lieutenant out there, and I knew once I knew him, <clears throat> I knew who he was, heard his voice, and I thought, okay, this is it. Now they're going to come in, so i got to do it. How fast do you stab yourself eight times with the, that kind of pressure outside of the door? Um, I mean, are you I, just like... I would say it was, <laughs> yeah, it was continuous. Like yeah, it was... Gosh. I hit one time deep. You know, at the time, I was bench pressing like 450 pounds. I was pretty strong. Um, first time, nothing. Um, not even much blood second time nothing and then somewhere in the middle I tried to cut my jugular vein on the right side that my skin was so tight I think from um, anxiety was and this so a forth. dull knife no it was sharp but adrenaline can do a lot of things right. to the body especially skin um, so I went back to the chest and finally I remember the eighth time I thought I've got to, I've really got to do this because now they're starting to come through the door, and that one put me down. I actually punctured my, you know, the outer sac of my heart. Um, and I remember hitting the floor. I hit, hit the wall right by the window, and I remember laying there, and I dropped the knife, and I could see the blood. Um, laying on my back, I could see the blood shooting up like a fountain. I remember my, I had my arms to my sides, and I thought, wow, this is, this is it. Now I'm going to go. I literally remember looking, you know, for a light, everything we've heard about. Um, didn't see it. My arms got cold. But all of a sudden, I'm conscious, and I'm not, you know, I'm not losing consciousness. I'm breathing. I don't think I punctured a lung. And um, the door comes down. And next thing I know, I got a, a cop on top of me who was, you know, screaming for four by fours with your pads, you know, cause uh, packs and asking me who did this to you? Did you do it to yourself? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and I was thinking, wow, this didn't work. So, um, did you have that quiet moment with yourself? where you have this acceptance I did. and is it because to me i think that somebody's looking down at a gun um you know i think that that's just such a a, a moment where i i think that somebody's going to commit suicide is they're just going to think about the problems or whatever and everything and then accept things and then there's just this moment where you go fuck it yeah. And you do it. Is yeah. that how it is? Right. There was a fuck it moment. It was like they're going to kick the door down. I mean, it's going to come in any minute, any second. So I've really got to get aggressive. I was aggressive. Um, I mean, I had gone to the blade. It was a 10 inch blade. I'd gone to the handle. Um, God. And so I said to myself, I've really got to do this. And I did hit the, the carpet. Like you were like, I really, I really have to I do really this. have to fucking I go. I do this. I really have to go. I I can't fucking stay here anymore. I really got to go. And I was like, liking it to someone chasing you and thinking, I've got to jump that barbed wire fence. Fuck it. I'm going to get cut up. But you know what I mean? So I had to do it. Um, and it hurt. That one I felt. I didn't feel the the, the prior, you know, stab wounds. Um, that one I felt um, all the way through my body. And when I, like I said, I got to the ground and... No, I did. I did. Ha I had that piece, though. 
Um, I said, okay, well, this one did it. I, like I said, I could see the blood. That's why I mentioned that. Um, and I knew it was serious. I knew I'd probably done some damage. I thought I'd hit you know, an artery, which is what I was trying to do. And The piece that you talk about, what kind of piece is that? It was momentary, uh, MJ. It was, it was a matter of seconds. I was literally thinking, okay, you know, I'm going to come see you. Um, talking to my wife. Um, I really did miss her a lot. And, but I was looking for that light that, you know, that, you know, into the light thing we all hear about, mm -hmm. um, which I don't know was, if it's true or not, but I didn't have any of that. But that, that piece I really experienced for a matter of seconds was quickly interrupted when they all came through the door. <clears throat> so they come in and they take you and now you go to the hospital or are you out and then are you just never lost consciousness never um no they scooped me up <clears throat> um and it was um yeah it was an ambulance um a siren everything on the phone with the hospital um i remember them talking to the doctors on the phone um or or the intercom in the ambulance and he was saying we're going to I remember the firefighter saying we're going to intubate him and he said I have breath sounds on both sides which means I didn't have a punctured lung so they said okay well don't you know don't put a don't intubate him um, but they got to the hospital really quickly and I remember them saying he said look at me and I looked at him he said there's going to be a lot of people a lot of people touching you, doing all kinds of things. I mean, it was a serious deal. And um, um, a matter of seconds, I was there. And it was. It was a trauma bay full of people, full of doctors, nurses, radiologists. Um, you, you spoke, you told me about one nurse. <sighs> and, and it always does this. Every time, every time we've talked about this, mm -hmm. she grabbed my hand and... Um, <clears throat> was this in that moment or was it the next day? No, it was in, in it, right when they wheeled me in. Um, her job was to grab my hand and to say that, she said, I don't know how things are going to turn out for you, but everybody here cares about you. We're going to do the best we can um, and you're in good hands. And she squeezed my hand so tight, and I remember squeezing her hand back, and she never let go. And that was a real poignant moment for me because um, I had thought that no one cared. You know, my family dropped off my friends. No one was in contact with me, but at that moment, someone cared, and she really cared. I mean, I felt she was vibrating at the same level I was, and I felt her energy, and... Um, and she meant it, and she never let go of my hand. I mean, for probably thirty minutes. Um, well, I can see and feel that you are very emotional about that. Every, Out of everything we've every, talked about, every time that that, that one you brought that up before, we've talked about this many times, and that always gets me. Is that the human connection that I, makes us all? Like that, that moment where we're all one together, like that you connection know, uh, that you really needed because it doesn't sound like from your childhood, not being told that you were loved mm -hmm. and marriages and that you loved your wife and now she's gone, but that, that, that somebody cares. A stranger cared, yeah. And it was a stranger. And I had... that Finally, because now your family's <clears throat> left. Nobody tried to stop you. Nobody was like worried about you. No. So it, it took a stranger for you to feel like no. one person on this planet cared. I had two sisters who were in that, in that room at that house where I was laying on the floor bleeding. Um, and they were both police officers and uh, neither, one, neither one of them said a word to me. They wouldn't even come into the trauma bay. And one of them was truly my best friend, a best friend, and had totally accepted me into her family and said, you will forever be a brother of ours. Um, and that day you weren't. Um, I even motioned to her, looking. I remember looking at the curtain, seeing her standing there. I motioned for her to come in, and she just looked at me. So, um, 
so that moment where you go to take your life and this is something that's been decided you have absolutely no plans of was it that you really 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 wanted to die or was it that you really wanted the pain to stop because there are a lot of people out there that fantasize about mm -hmm. suicide and it there's this dialogue that they have with themselves and their mind and the problem with that listeners is that you're not speaking this stuff out and if you were talking speaking out the things that you're thinking in your head it's much different it right. it it does something to the because a lot of people don't want to really die they just want the pain to stop true true um i've learned a lot about suicide in these last uh, few years since i've you know been sharing my experience strength and hope with others and um for one thing i never talked i never said a word to anybody about about the suicide i mean it was in contact with people um i never said gee i think i'm thinking about taking my life um uh, with the exception of the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Um, Do you think it would have made a difference if, I mean... Had, had they come out that Wednesday? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it may have. I think it's very possible, sure, because I believe, well, from what they told me that night, they were, they were like, look, we can provide you housing, we can get you out of the situation, get you back on your feet. Right. And they needed okay. help. And I your was biggest fear was being homeless. Being homeless, yeah. And I'm, I said, look, I don't want to be... I don't want to be doing these drugs anymore. Um, you know, I'm I'm done. I don't. Were I you really, really, really done? I was done. I didn't want to take my life. I really loved my dog. Oh my gosh, my daughter's my life. Uh, my dogs were my life. What's your relationship like now with your daughter? It's good. Yeah. Aww. I don't see her enough, but she moved. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's awesome. Yeah. So it took a year. You survived. Mm -hmm. suicide <laughs> yeah i survived suicide and it, it probably important to throw this into um i um i'll never forget the doctor um there were some trauma surgeons in that room i say plural there was more than one but the doctor i won't mention her name because i don't have uh, permission to but um she is a she is a fucking badass surgeon and she's a boss and um she's the one who handled me that day she's the one who who stapled me up, stitched me up, and um, came to my room the next morning with a bunch of uh, students. And the first thing she said was, um, there's no reason why I should be standing here, and you should be laying there, and we should be talking. And I said, why? She goes, because what you did, you should have, you shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be here. And she goes, if you don't believe in something, you better fucking find something to believe in. And she used those exact words. She goes, better find something to believe in. You Meaning, better fucking. <laughs> she said, you better fucking find something to believe in. Yeah. Which I thought was pretty cool. Um, I don't know, speaking my language, but, and she was speaking of a higher power of, of some sort. Um, Did you believe in God before oh, yeah, this absolutely. happened? Absolutely. Oh, I've been a Christian all my life. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I, and I did. Um, I said, I, I do. I had, in fact, I sat with the chaplain. He sat with me for three hours that night. I was in ICU for, for nine days. He sat with me for three hours that night because his wife had died of breast cancer. We had a lot in common. He was roughly my age. And um, he said, man, I, I, I've been doing this for 16 years and I've never met anybody who's forgiven themselves as quickly as you have. Once I was taken upstairs to ICU, I was grateful to be alive, and I thought this will be a means to an end, meaning I'm not going to be homeless and so forth. Um, this right here is what we are. What we're, this is this is like what I really want to talk about too, because mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. if you could go back, I mean, what did attempted suicide? Um. You know what, Em, I don't think I've changed anything. I really don't. My journey has been so rich since, and I'm, I'm not trying to minimize what I did and trying to take my life, but I really don't think I'd be where I'm at today had I not gone through everything I've gone through. Um, inevitably, I did end up homeless um, on the streets, literally. Um, so you could so. <laughs> So you couldn't even avoid that? Couldn't avoid that, no. And so, but you have such a greater appreciation for life and you look at life completely, totally different. Totally. 
Yeah. What would you say to anybody out there that is thinking of suicide that's hurting right now? Is it? E- Let me ask you about this. Let's let's the ego. Isn't it was the ego a factor in losing everything and then being homeless and wanting to kill yourself? Um, part part and partial. It wasn't an e- no ego in um, losing everything um, at the time. Um, I was just so, dem- I was a, just uh, basically a shell of a person at that point. Um, but ego after the fact, being on the streets, and nobody gives a fuck about who you were. I mean, the homeless population is an interesting, it's, it's a whole, I had no idea that the homeless population, at least in Maricopa County, exists in the, in the fashion it does. It's, an, it, it's a whole world that operates unlike any other world, unlike anything anybody can imagine unless you've been a part of it. Um, and they don't give a fuck where you were, who you were, what you had. Um, they don't believe you anyway. All they want to do is steal from you, um, get what they can from you. And, but, you know. But go- you would still be, I mean, you'd still go through everything again, even being homeless, your experience I, to I, be, I mean, the suicide was, you know, I, I say that, um, but with I, I we really didn't want to put my daughter through this. I really didn't want to lose my dogs. Um, I specifically put in a note, please keep the dogs, four dogs together, and they weren't kept together. Um, those dogs were really special. Um, I think about them today. That's another thing that gets me choked up. Um, is about two years ago, I was able to finally look at a picture of my dogs, and now I can look at pictures all the time. Um, and I've come to terms with that. But um, no, I wouldn't put my daughter through what I did. And I certainly wouldn't lose my dogs. But with the exception of that. What would you say to anybody? Because when you and I talk about this, you're like, man, I just am so glad I'm alive. Life is right. worth living. It really is. Um, I would say to anybody... I mean, everyone's different. I mean, so you said it earlier, suicide is a function of stopping the pain. And a lot of people don't understand that. It's If you're that depressed where you want to take your life, you're in, in an immense amount, amount of pain that no one can understand unless you've been there. You think there's no way out. There's no hope. There's no anything. Um, you've you basically resign yourself to the fact that your life will be hollow and nothing and it's only going to get worse. So why stay? And it really takes a certain, I, I know there's a dynamic, some type of uh, chemical change in the brain that probably allows someone to get to that point, I mean, of depression where you're actually thinking of killing yourself. But um, because so many people do it, unfortunately. But I would say just reach out to someone um, reach out to me, reach out to anybody who's been there, especially a survivor. Um, and there's so much help out there. When we do post this um, episode, I will include on our social media the suicide hotline, contact information, and just resources because even if it's a stranger that is touching your hand uh, or somebody that's just picking up the phone, it's it's talking about your feelings and your thoughts that change things. Right. But what I've learned um, over the last several months is most people have become so withdrawn if they're to the point of killing themselves that they're not even in contact with anyone. So call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Um, these people care. I mean, these people that volunteer really care. I mean, they're there 24 um, 7. The guy in Kansas City stayed on the phone with me until he could get someone on the phone in Phoenix. He said, I'm not going anywhere. I mean, they really care. So. Um, you do, you do have to reach out. Um, gosh, I just, I'm living proof that things can get so bad and so grim. Um, you can lose everything. You can survive something you probably shouldn't have, I shouldn't have survived. Um, and your life can be just whole and beautiful and rich after the fact not from the standpoint of helping others but 
Um, I've always been ambitious. I've always been, you know, an artist, a creative person, and I just can't contain the creativity in the last couple of years. I mean, it just, I can't wait to live another 50 years. And mm, that's a powerful statement right there. Yeah. That's powerful. Yeah. Um, as you know, there's always three questions that I ask every guest. <laughs> And I'm going to ask you, mm -hmm. where is the love in your story? The love is for myself. Um, I truly love myself. I can look in the mirror and like the person that I am today. I really love myself. And I don't mean that from an egotistical, um, you know, conceited standpoint. I really like the person I see. I like the person I am. I know I'm a good person. Yes, you are. You, you really are. Thank you. I really enjoyed getting to know you. Uh, likewise. Over the years. Uh, likewise, yeah. You know, that's the other thing I want to share with the listeners is that Steve and I met on Facebook mm -hmm. and you were following me in my art and you knew that I was doing a piece on suicide. Right. And you reached out and you were very honest. I had a lot of people that reach out about the topics that I'm covering, but, you know... Um, there are no coincidences and something mm -hmm. about uh, the timing for us and over the time that we have known each other, it's, I've, you are a good person. Well, you have a good heart. So are you. You are truly my favorite lady on the planet. Honestly. Really? Really. Honestly. Honestly. <laughs> honestly you are. And to anybody who's listening, this is the best friend anybody could have. Um, MJ Aww. is is just, I can't say enough about her. And I think if you ask anybody who knows her, they'll say the same thing. Um, she's a wonderful person. Thank so you. you're welcome. Thank you for all you've done for me. I appreciate that. I That's appreciate awesome. that as well. Um, wow, that makes me want to tear up. I feel oh. that. Thank you. Really, you're honestly. Welcome. Uh, what is the lie in your story? The lie is that I think it's kind of a veil that um, you can get so depressed and so down and so lost that there's no way out. That would be the lie. That's a lie. Um, you just have to reach out and ask for help. You have to pick yourself up and... and um, you can only do that by talking to people who've been there and maybe reaching out saying, you know, I'm so down um, that I'll never get up and having someone say, hey, you know, I stabbed myself in the chest eight times and I'm still here. So you can get back up. Um, I've done it. I've helped people. In fact, the first person I helped was a mutual friend of ours. He called me one day and he was in a bad way. Oh, still, that's right. He's yeah. still with us I today. Connected you, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's awesome. That was the first, um, first assignment, if you will. That's right, because you told term. me about your story, and then he was telling me that's, he came to me for yeah. help, and I'm I right. don't. I said I got to connect you with somebody who absolutely understands where you're at, and, you and called he's still me, with us. And you said, "Can you call him right now?" And you met right now. And you guys did not know each other <clears throat> at all. I was on the no, no, and he's somebody that was, you know, his thing was about ego too because he had yeah. a lot everything, of money, everything, yeah. had and lost everything, and so now he's battling what, what everybody thinks and judgment and oh, it was huge, yeah. Um, yeah. I was on the phone with him for over two hours that first day, and we talked just continuously, day after day after day. And became good friends. God, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the truth? Um, the truth is that, um, boy, there's so many truths. I'd say the, the biggest truth is that there is help out there. Um, kind of ties in with the last question you asked. Um, that you can get help. Um, I mean, depression is a clinical, clinical problem. I mean, it needs to be treated and so forth. I didn't suffer from depression, but some people do. But the truth is, is that there is help. There are people out there. There are resources, and um, it's just available if you, if you have the clarity. I think to go get it. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me, you guys. 
It's the truth by Steve. <laughs> That's we just can't tell you the name. <laughs> we can lie about the name. Yeah. I love the anonymous interviews because it is nothing but truth. And I always go back to if you give a man a mask, he will tell you everything. And it's true. Yeah, it is true. Um You've shared everything with us. I've shared everything with uh, pretty much everyone I've encountered who's wanted to know and some who haven't wanted to know in the last uh, couple of years. I believe in telling my story. So, mm, Well, we're going to tell it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, Absolutely. ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. This is your host, MJ. Much love. Mwah. That was good. Mm-hmm.